Hi, and welcome to Plain Legacy. Today we'll be looking at the Bell P-59 Air Comet. The development of jet aircraft is clearly an important milestone in aviation. In the United States, the first jet-powered aircraft was the Bell P-59, known as the Air Comet. The design was actually ordered in September of 1941, just two months before the attack at Pearl Harbor. When we're talking about jet airplanes in World War II, the conversation is usually about the German ME 262 and the Arado 234, maybe the British Gloucester Meteor or the American P 80, and usually it's only talking about the last few months of the war. Maybe with the exception of the ME 262, jet airplanes are almost treated as a footnote of World War II history. But 1941 was a time when Germany and Great Britain were already working on jet propulsion and the United States was lagging far behind. After seeing the British example of jet propulsion in person in April 1941, General Henry Hap Arnold became convinced the United States should begin producing a jet fighter of their own. Shortly afterwards, General Arnold met with Lawrence Bell of the Bell Aircraft Company to discuss a need for jet aircraft. The Bell Aircraft Corporation had been founded by Lawrence Bell just six years earlier in July of 1935. Like so many, his lifelong passion for aviation began early in life after seeing his first airplane at an air show. But his aviation career began at the Glenn L. Martin Company in 1912, where he rose to shop superintendent in just two years and later vice president and general manager of its Cleveland, Ohio division. Denied part ownership in the company, he quit in 1924 and stayed out of aviation for a while, but returned to the industry in 1928 when he went to work as a general manager for Consolidated Aircraft in Buffalo, New York. When Consolidated moved their operations to San Diego, California, Bell started his own company and moved into the former Consolidated facilities on Elmwood Avenue in Buffalo. The plant had a long history of aircraft production, having once belonged to the Curtis Airplane and Motor Company and was considered the largest aircraft plant in the world during World War I. The program to develop the United States military's first jet was conducted in extreme secrecy. It was a collaboration between Bell Aircraft Company, manufacturing the aircraft, and the General Electric Corporation of Schenectady, New York, producing the engines. After the United States Army Air Force gave its approval, the project began early in 1942 in what had once been a Pierce Arrow automobile factory in Buffalo. Later, production was moved to the second story of a former Ford automobile plant in that city. That building's windows were welded shut and their glass was painted over, guards patrolling around the building. The P-59 was a conventional single-seat twin-engine design with an electrically operated, fully retractable tricycle landing gear. This nose wheel layout was one favored in Bell airplane designs. The all-metal aircraft was 38 feet, 10 inches long, in a stressed skin, semi-monocoque design with a mid-fuselage straight wing that had a 45-foot, 6-inch span. The flight control surfaces were fabric-covered, including the electrically operated flaps that were positioned inboard of the ailerons. Its tailplane was positioned high enough to be out of the, any interference from the engine exhaust, and its cockpit was heated and fully pressurized, which was still a novelty for its time. The aircraft was built around Britain's revolutionary Whittle W1X turbojet, made in the United States under license by General Electric as the J31. The first engines were delivered in August of 1942. Each of the single-stage turbine engines produced 1,650 pounds of thrust, enabling a maximum speed of 450 miles per hour, though the cruising speed was 320 miles per hour. A range of 440 miles could be achieved with a normal service ceiling of 43,400 feet. Early in the program, engines were referred to as the IA and later the I-14 and I-16 models 
for security reasons and hopes that foreign intelligence would not suspect its real nature. In the summer of 1942, the XP-59A was ready to ship from Buffalo to Muroc Dry Lake facility in California for testing. However, the completed aircraft was actually too large to fit in the elevator on the second floor facility where it was built. So a hole had to be cut in the side of the building large enough to get the plane outside and loaded onto rail cars and three large crates. During the trip, compressed air was used during transportation to Muroc to turn the compressors to avoid possible damage to the engine bearings. Even at a secure test facility like Muroc, later known as Edwards Air Force Base, additional security measures were implemented. A fake propeller was attached to the front of the airplane to disguise it whenever it was being towed outside of the hangar. The first flight of the P-59 took place on October 1, 1942 at the Muroc Dry Lake Test Runway and was flown by Bell's chief test pilot, Robert M. Stanley. Stanley had been a naval aviator prior to World War II and would later found his own company, Stanley Aviation, in the basement of his Buffalo residence. That company would eventually relocate to Colorado where he would design ejection seats and escape pods for high-speed aircraft. Stanley is credited with the design that enabled Bell's supersonic X-1 and X-2 aircraft to be air-launched from a B-29. We'll take a look at the X-2 in a future video. With Stanley at the controls, the P-59 first took flight inadvertently during a high-speed taxiing test. I think that comes under the category of accidentally on purpose. During later test flights, though, an unofficial altitude record of 47,600 feet was achieved. Throughout the testing that followed, the P-59's performance was mediocre and no combat version was ever produced. The P-59 was plagued by the problems common to early jet engines, including slow response to the throttles, poor overall thrust, and some reliability issues. The design also struggled with lateral and directional stability, making it a challenge both for flying and for aerial gunnery. This twin-engine jet aircraft struggled against contemporary single-engine piston-powered fighter airplanes in mock combat trials. The military lost interest in the P-59 as a combat aircraft, believing no major design improvements would be forthcoming, putting their support instead behind Lockheed's P-80 Shooting Star, and we'll take a look at the P-80 in a future episode too. Ironically, it was General Arnold's refusal for this top-secret project to have access to full-scale model, high-speed wind tunnel testing that may have contributed to the Air Comet's design weaknesses. While a low-speed wind tunnel at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio was eventually made available, Bell designers could only make well-educated guesses in some areas of its design. Weighing in at 10,532 pounds fully loaded, the P-59 could carry one 37mm cannon and three 50 caliber machine guns in the nose of the airplane. Sources say a 2,000-pound bomb load or eight rockets could also be carried. Fuel was carried in four 290-gallon self-sealing fuel tanks in all models, with the B model having an additional 66-gallon fuel tank in each of the outer wing panels. Drop tanks could be attached, adding to the overall fuel capacity. A total of 66 aircraft were produced, out of the original 100 that were ordered. This number includes three XP-59A, 13 prototype YP-59 aircraft, along with the 20 P-59A and 30 P-59B models. The P-59B shown in this video is on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. It was sent to the museum from Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico in 1956. This example doesn't include the armament it could have carried, but it is a well-preserved example of a historic aircraft. The legacy of the P-59 falls into three categories. Even if not widely known, it is the first jet aircraft produced in the United States. Secondly, while it never flew in any military units or saw combat, the testing programs provided valuable knowledge about a new technology, helping designers produce improved designs in the future. It was also a test bed for various systems that would be incorporated into future aircraft. 
And finally, it gave pilots first-hand experiences in jet-powered flight and its challenges. From this little-known aircraft, many flyers became trained jet pilots ready to apply those skills to the jets coming in the future. My thanks to the National Museum of the United States Air Force Museum for use of some of their photos from their website, including this picture of the cockpit of the P-59. Looking at the control panel, we'll look at the uh, instruments here just very briefly, starting at the top and going from left to right. The airspeed indicator is at the top left with a navigational gyro just beside it. On the second row down, we see a clock with a directional gyro in the center and an artificial artificial horizon on the right. Third row in, uh, starts off with an altimeter on the left, a turn and bank indicator, and a vertical speed, that is the rate of climb indicator, uh, and then the RPM gauge. And on the bottom row, a second altimeter. I'm not sure why this example had two altimeters, but if you know, put that in the comments for the rest of us to learn from, please. And then in the center, uh, the left and right engine temperature gauge, along with a fuel gauge. On the left-hand wall of the cockpit, we see the throttle quadrant. And back on the right, we see the pressurization controls, a brake control, an emergency crank lever for the landing gear, and also something that could move the canopy back and forth. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, would you please leave a like and consider subscribing. We have much more content coming your way. Thanks again, and have an awesome day.